a moment about the tooth fairy. Now, before you think, oh, Naomi's gone a little bit off track, what does the tooth fairy have to do with anything? I want you just to bear with me. And I'm going to read through some of this because it's really quite important. So for all of us at some point in our lives, we've experienced the loss of teeth. For me, it's literally the stuff of nightmares. I have ongoing nightmares about my teeth crumbling and falling out. For some of us, the loss of teeth is considered a rite of passage. We know that around the ages of between sort of four and a half to seven, young person will lose their first tooth and that will continue into their teens and they're losing those big molars at the back. Some people see it as a rite of passage. Others recall it as a traumatic experience. Anyone whose mother or father tried to tie the little piece of string around that wobbly tooth, tie it to a door and slam it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of us have young people in our lives that are going through this. I am one of them. I have a five and seven year old. I have a guy who's going through a process of natural tooth elimination. I have another guy who's going through at one emergency dental appointment at a time. It's traumatic, not just for him, but also for me. So the natural guy, he comes running into me. Mummy, mummy, I've got a wobbly tooth. Instantly, and even now talking about it, I get goosebumps. As soon as his little tongue starts to do the flicking wobbly thing, ooh, it just gives me chills. I find it tough to talk about it. I find it even harder to watch, but I endure it because I have to. It's a natural part of his growing. And as the primary caregiver, he is relying on me to provide a sense of safety and a sense of okayness around this tooth losing process. It's part of his development and my role is to guide him through that process. We talk about the tooth wobbling and we talk about what it might feel like when it falls out. That funny little sensation you get when you constantly then put your tongue through the gap that the tooth has left. <laughs> we talk about how to manage the blood, how we're gonna look after the gum and how we're going to start caring for that tooth that's coming through and the importance of brushing. I don't scuttle him off into the bathroom and say, you're about to lose a tooth, but you know, this is personal secret business. We're not gonna talk about this to anybody else. I don't want you to go to school and talk to your friends about this. This is just something that you have to go through. Once it's fallen out, can you just not tell me about it? Can you just go and put it in the drawer over there and we'll deal with it later? We don't talk like that to our young people about losing teeth. We talk about it in a positive, engaging way. And in fact, when they lose that tooth eventually, we celebrate that loss. A little thing called a tooth fairy comes and leaves a special gold coin behind. I want you to now think and imagine if sex and relationships were treated the same way as losing teeth. That is that we informed young people on how to prepare. We spoke about what it may feel like. We discuss not just the physicality of sex and relationships, but also the emotionality that comes with it. We celebrate the safe choices that the young person made when it came to their relationships and sexual health. And we were there offering love and support, no matter how difficult or how awkward the conversation was for us, or how difficult it was for us to handle just the same way that we do when they're losing their teeth. I mean, think about it. Why should conversations around sexual health and relationships be any different to the conversations that we're having with young people on a daily basis? It's all part of their health and well-being, and it's all intertwined. The more openly and honestly we can talk to them about this stuff, the more trust and rapport we build with them. If we talk to them about the little stuff when they're little, they're more likely to talk to us about the big stuff when they're big, and that's important. It's about empowerment and education. It's crucial for us as senior adults within that young person's life to be that safe point, that safeguard. They can come to us and engage in these conversations. And this is about us as adults helping them to navigate that transition as they move from being a child into an adolescent and then into an adulthood. So as an aside for the status amongst us, I've kept all of my children's teeth, either naturally or forced removal. <laughs> 
And uh, there's a bit of math that it, there's a bit of method in my madness though, because I figure that when the tooth fairy is no longer believable, I'm going to return the teeth to the said owner and ask for my money back. Cha ching. <laughs> P.S. Santa totally exists. He just has lots of helpers. Don't want to burst all your fantasy bubbles. Okay, so young people and challenging questions. I need to prepare you. Young people are going to ask challenging questions when it comes to things like sex, sexuality, sexual health, and relationships. Some of them are juicy, some of them are prickly, like our fruits on the screen, but they are all important and they all need to be addressed. When young people come to us and ask us those challenging questions, it's often a way for them to test us, to see what our response and our reaction is, and then they can gauge how comfortable we are to have that conversation with them and whether we're going to be able to provide them with the information that they're seeking or not. First and foremost, it's really important to be unshockable. I know that it's easy for us as sexual health promotion officers to say that because there's not too many things that we haven't uh, heard over the years, but be really mindful of your facial expressions. Inside, you can be screaming to yourself thinking, oh my goodness, I have no idea what they're talking about or I can't believe that they've come out and asked me that question. But on the outside, we need to be really neutral because something like our body language and our facial expressions could really impact on that relationship or that rapport that we have with the young person. A tip is to stay curious and not to get your thinking into black and white or right versus wrong, okay? A favorite quote of mine is, it's not wrong, it's just different. And these days, young people are doing things that are very different to generations in the past. We will have a look at some of those things later, but the ease of access to things like technology means that some of their experiences are very different to what ours were as young people. And as I said, it doesn't make what they're doing as wrong. It just makes it different. What we need to do as those adults and carers is, is to provide ourselves with the information that we need to then be able to help the young person navigate and manage that. Also be mindful of things such as language and tone. So that really builds into that non-verbal um, communication as well. If a young person is talking to you about a partner, so say for example a male is talking to you about a partner, don't just assume that that partner is a female. Refer to that person as a partner until that young person has verified or clarified that indeed it is a male or a female. It might sound really simple, but things like our language are incredibly important. Because if we'd made the assumption that when he spoke about a partner that it was a female and that young man actually happens to be same sex attracted, we could have just significantly damaged the rapport that we've built with that young person. And they may not feel as comfortable to come to us again in future to ask those questions. So just be really mindful of that language and tone that we're using. I really like to see it as an honor or a privilege when a young person comes to me with a difficult question, even if I do find it difficult or challenging, it means that they have enough respect and trust within me as a person to come and ask that question. So I want you to see that the same way. Instead of thinking, oh my goodness, I can't believe they've come and asked this, feel a bit of honor or privilege around the fact that they have reached out to you. And again, as I touched on before, this is where honesty is really important. We don't want the young person um, having incorrect information, which if they're going online to get that information or speaking to their peers, they may get. So if a young person asks a question that you don't know the answer to, seek out that information together. There's lots of ways that you can get that information together. And Caitlin's gonna take us through that at the end of this session. Just be honest, thank them for asking the question. Thanks for asking that question. That's a great question. I don't know the answer, but how about we find out together? It's a shared learning experience and it's also a role modeling experience. And we're gonna talk about role modeling quite a bit as we move into these coming sections.